say thank you very much for the kind invitation and for the nice word of introduction. And I'm very happy to be here and uh, speak about this topic. Uh, in this talk, I'm going to ask really childish questions, such as why do we have mass at all? What happens to nothing? Empty space if we heat it up? And could the world look different? The bad news is it's going to be a lattice talk, and uh, some of you might have heard lattice talks, and uh, they have a reputation of being boring. But I know that it's an uh, uh, audience with a lot of students. I had a discussion, a lively discussion with them, so I will try to do my best and concentrate on the physical ideas and be self-contained and uh, polish up a little bit our reputation as a lattice physicist. So this is the outline of my talk. Uh, after a brief introduction, how do we generate masses at all? I will come to an old theory, a 40 years old theory, QCD, and explain it, how it works. And then I come to the determination of the nucleon, which is the neutron and the proton, and a couple of other hadrons we have in nature. And then to a work which reaches three orders of magnitude, better accuracies, namely the mass difference of the neutron and the proton. And that's the most important message which I want you to bring home, that after 40 years, we are at a level where we can solve, where we can solve QCD with an accuracy of a sub per mil, which is something amazing. And finally, I summarize. So ordinary matter is actually built up from three particles. An electron is around the proton, for instance, for the hydrogen. And the proton consists of two U quarks and a B quark. If you go on and look at the helium, then you have neutrons in it. Then you have two D quarks and one U quark. Actually. This is family one, and we have three families with other type of quarks, for instance, strange and charm quark. I will speak about them a little bit later, but for now, it has nothing to do with ordinary matter, so we just leave them out and work with the first family. And each family has a neutrino in it, but we don't deal with them right now either. These particles have essentially the following interactions which are important for us. The electric, the strong interaction, and interaction with the Higgs field. The problem is that on the very basic level of theory, all these particles are massless. So you can ask the question, why do we have mass at all then? Or why do not we just fly apart with the velocity of speed. And there are three mechanisms I'm going to discuss today which are responsible for that. The strong mass, the electromagnetic mass, and mass from the Higgs mechanism. Let me start with the strong mass. Imagine a massless box. Put in your particles, your quarks, and shake it. Each particle will have a kinetic energy, and as we know, energy is mass, so this energy can be interpreted as a mass. So far so good, you can ask, where do you get the massless box? And it is there, actually. The strong force is a massless box in a way that if you have two quarks, or a quark and an anti-quark, and you try to pull them apart, then the force between them is not going to zero, it's going to be constant, so it is efficiently or effectively a box because you cannot bring them far away. That's what we call confinement, quark confinement. And when you have a quark and an anti-quark, that's a meson, for instance, a pion. When you have three quarks, UUD, then it's a baryon, for instance, a proton. We call them all together hadrons. And I will look for various hadrons 
in our theory. So we have all sat with the strong interaction. Then we have the electric interaction. And you have to remember that all these particles have electric charges. That means electric fields. Electric fields mean energy. And this energy can be interpreted again as mass. So we have a nice illustration for the mass coming from the electromagnetic interaction. The last one which I have to speak about is the mass associated with the Higgs boson or the Higgs field. And I was thinking a lot how to explain it in a minute or two, and I didn't find any good way. It's somehow too complicated for me. But I found a highly undervalued scientist who can explain it in seven seconds. And uh, <laughs> listen carefully, because it's seven seconds. Huh? So what he's saying? We're doing a better job of talking to each other. The left hand now knows what the right hand is doing. So uh, don't, don't be distracted by the fact that he raises his right hand and saying that the left hand now knows what the right hand is doing. I play it again, so be careful, look carefully, listen carefully. This is the last time I, I'm showing him. We're doing a better job of talking to each other. The left hand now knows what the right hand is doing. Good. So what did he say? You need a better job of talking to each other. The left hand now knows what the right hand is doing. And indeed, that's the origin of the Higgs mechanism. Let me explain these seven seconds, because he's very dense. So these particles which I listed have spin. And if the spin is spinning in this direction and the particle is moving in that direction, then we call it a left-handed. And if it is doing the other way around, then we call it a right-handed. And what he said, that we have to link these two things together. They have to talk to each other. And indeed, that's the mass. So if you have a particle which is left-handed and flying with a velocity of v, you can always find a train with a velocity which is larger than v. And then you are traveling, and the particle is flying in the other direction, but the spin is just the same. So for a massless particle, you can connect the left and the right-handed mass and that's actually the most important feature of the Higgs mechanism. The Higgs field links the right-handed and the left-handed particles. So we are all set. You know, the strong electromagnetic and Higgs fields and how they contribute to the mass. Now I come to this 40-year-old theory, the quantum chromodynamics. And I just want to say a few words on that before I try to solve it. So this is the theory of the strong interaction. And this is the generalized extended version of electrodynamics. In what sense? In electrodynamics, we have only one charge, the electric. It can be positive or negative. In chromodynamics, we have three charges. They call them colors, red, blue, and green. Of course, they are not colors but they can be positive or negative. And the gluons, similarly to the photons, transmit the strong interaction between quarks, which are similar to electrons. It has a richer structure, because uh, color of quarks can be changed by gluons, which cannot happen in electrodynamics. You cannot change the charge of a particle by photons. That means that the gluons are charged. And the bad news is that neither free gluons nor quarks have a seen. The fundamental degrees of freedom don't appear experimentally. But I will say a few words on that later on. So what does it mean on a little bit more formal level? This is the Lagrangian of electrodynamics. You have the f mu nu, f mu nu. And here you have the psi bar psi with a covariant derivative and a mass term. And f mu nu as we learn it, is d mu a nu, d minus d mu a nu. For chromodynamics, you have exactly the same Lagrangian. The only difference is that the a mu is a 3 times 3 matrix, 
and because we have three colors, Psi has also an index running from one to three. And for F mu nu, you have D mu A nu minus D mu A nu, and these commutator, which is obviously disappearing in electrodynamics because these are matrices here and they are just numbers there. The good news, this is unambiguously fixed by gauge invariance or almost, which means that you can use a phase factor symmetry to define your theory. And the task now is to solve it in a quantized manner. And as you say, it's highly nonlinear because you have these terms there. So it's a quantum field theory, highly nonlinear, and that's why it took 40 years to solve it. Before I go and show you how to solve it, let me point out a few similarities and differences between electrodynamics and QCD. So this is a uh, experimental plot from the Delphi collaboration showing something which is the basic interaction in QED. The basic interaction is that the electron is coming in, emits a photon, and flying on. And exactly that's what you see. Here is a line, a lepton line, emitting a photon exactly the same way as you see it here in this graph. This is the only elementary process in QED. And the chains that you see such a process is about 1%. And we understand why it is 1% because the coupling here is 1 over 137, so it should be about 1%. And since this is so small, we can use this diagrammatic technique, which has the name of Feynman diagrams, to calculate various quantities, such as the magnetic moment of the electron comes in, interacts with the magnetic field, goes on, emits a photon, this photon is uh, producing a pair, and so on and so forth. And since this coupling is small, you can tailor expand in this coupling and have a result which is converging, or almost converging, and you have an agreement up to many, many digits between experiment and theory great news, and these diagrammatic perturbative technique was found, for instance, uh, or for, was used when we found the Higgs boson. This is the cleanest graph for the Higgs boson search based on the same technique. What can we say about QCD? The same experiment, the lab experiment, which is the experiment in the same tunnel where LHC is running today, and it has a hadronic or a strong interaction graph here. The basic interaction is again a quark is coming in, going out and emitting the gluon. And what you see here is something similar but different. If you look very close to short distances, then it really looks like that three particles are there. This one, that one, and that one. It is actually 10% of the QCD processes, which tells us that the coupling is 10 times larger. But you don't see single particles, single quarks or gluons coming out, because at large distances, as we have seen, they are confined. Short distances, small interaction, large distances, large interaction. And this is the confinement phenomenon. So we see that it is stronger, we see the asymptotic freedom, and we see the confinement phenomenon. And that was found by these three gentlemen who got the Nobel Prize for it, that at short distances or large momenta, the coupling is small, or at small momenta, large distances, the coupling is large. And that somehow makes us to believe that if somebody has a lot of energy or very high temperature, then these coupling get smaller and smaller, and the particles which are confined will be liberated 
3D's asymptotic freedom. And that's core gluon plasma, and that will be the topic of next week's colloquium. And indeed, it happens at a given temperature, but since the coupling is very large, we cannot say too much about that perturbatively. This is one of my favorite illustrations to that end. So here I show you the pressure of this gas, which is liberated as a function of T over Tc. Tc is the temperature when this liberation happens. Okay. I divided it by the uh, Stefan Boltzmann limit, so the leading order would be 1. This is the next to leading order, this is the next to next to leading order, this is the next to next to next to leading order, and this is the next to next to next to next to leading order. And as you see, not even a sign can be predicted. So this uh, theory starts to converge around these temperatures. There are better techniques now, but it tells you that there is no way you can really figure out. The only way is a non-perturbative solution of the theory which is on the lattice, and that's the result of that which is shown here. You, you cannot even tell the value of this TC because it contains all these funny non-perturbative features of the theory. You cannot even tell if it is a first order phase transition, second order phase transition, or whatever. People believed it that it's a first order phase transition because it's such a huge difference having confined everything and then being liberated. So they thought that something like that happens in the early universe or in uh, heavy ion collisions, that there is a hot liberated plasma with freely moving quarks and gluons, and when the system in a little bang or the system in a big bang expands, then bubbles appear, and these bubbles will then fulfill with hadronic phase our universe or our system. But Lattice told us that it is something else. What is happening is a smooth analytic transition. You have these freely moving stuff and then it's getting more and more confined in a broad temperature region. And that's something which we, which we also use at uh, heavy ion collisions. So far, so good. I list here a couple of other problems which cannot be solved by any other means in a controlled manner, just by lattice QCD, for instance, TC, equation of state, you can extend it with SU2 and study the electroweak phase transition, extend to mu larger than zero, study the sign problem. If you go to very large temperatures and study the topology, you can contribute to axion cosmology, you can learn from G minus two, what sort of beyond the standard model physics can be. Since we will reach a per mil precision, you can use it for multi-hadron uh, cases, which at the end might redefine nuclear physics. What I'm speaking about today is hadron spectroscopy, where you can extend the other gauge group and other representation. You can find technical or, or strongly interacting particles Cosmology. These are the topics what we are dealing with in our groups, but there are plenty of other groups with dozens of other fields which cannot be solved perturbatively. But the basic message, let me say it again, what I want you to bring home, that now we have a per mil precision and we can use physical quark masses and carry out the continuum extrapolation. Continuum extrapolation means that I will put my theory on a grid, I will show you how, and the lattice spacing is getting smaller and smaller, and I can extrapolate to a zero lattice spacing continuum theory. How do I do that? So I'm studying a quantum field on a lattice, and the basic thing here is the so-called path integral. As you all learned, that you can calculate the transition amplitude from here to there by calculating the action for all possible paths yeah. and adding up 
these phase factors. It's very similar in quantum field theory. You can quantize quantum fields in a way that you add up all possible field configurations, yeah? calculate their action, put it in these phase factor, and make a summation of it. And that solves you quantum field theory. It's highly oscillating, so it's better to use Euclidean space-time with imaginary time, and that's going to be a sum of Boltzmann factors. Now, the step is to use a space-time grid in which you put your field variables. It, be, it will become a four-dimensional statistical system because you treat the Euclidean time as a fourth dimension. And as I said, we have to contra extrapolate to the continuum limit, taking smaller and smaller grid spacings. We are solving it numerically, which is a stochastic approach. And that means if you have small enough lattice spacing that you can resolve the proton without any problem, and the large enough system, then you are all set. The problem is that you need a lot of theory, a lot of understanding of algorithm, and a lot of CPU, obviously. And once you have a problem or an error or somehow a suboptimal decision here or there, it's very easy to end up with a project which costs 1,000 times more than in the optimal case. And you don't need to see. So the art is here to, to figure out, to have the feeling what to do here and there to be there at the very end. So how do we do that? So this is my grid or lattice. This is the Lagrangian I want to put it, quite simple. The anti-commuting quark fields live on the sides. And the gauge field, A mu, is integrated from here to there, exponentiated this form, what we call the link variable. Interestingly enough, the product of four of these link variables around the elementary plaquette is proportional to the gauge action, to this part of the action. Differentiating the quarks is even easier. You just take neighboring sides. Or if you have this covariant derivative in it, then you sandwich it with the link variable. What you should see here, that this is a bilinear expression. And when we integrate out over all possible fermionic fields, then it will give us a determinant. Most of the calculations done in with 2D generate light quarks, UD, these were the two quarks which we used to build up our proton and neutron, and one quark from the second family, which has the name of strange quark. So what we do, again, we add up or integrate over all possible field configurations using the action in this Boltzmann factor. And as we said, the fermionic part can be integrated out because it's just a bilinear expression. So you end up with the Boltzmann factor of the gauge action and the determinant of this M matrix. Of course, we do not add up every possible gauge action or gauge configuration. We select only the most important ones, or it's better to say, we take each of them with a probability which is proportional to their weight. That's exactly what we are doing in simulating the Ising model in sixth semester. And the procedure is called important sampling. One example for that is the Metropolis algorithm. And I'll show you how it works for QCD. So you have these field configuration of these three times three matrices on sitting on every link on your lattice. You change one of these link variable, one of these three times three matrix. 
and then accept this change with a probability which is the minimum of one, this Boltzmann factor times the determinant of the M matrix which I defined two slides before. One remark is in order. If you assume that this part of the problem is one, which is not true, but assume that this is one, then the only thing you have to calculate are the traces of three times three matrices. And it's easy and cheap, and that was used for 20, 25 years in Lapis QCD. It's easy to understand why. It's much easier to calculate the trace of a three times three matrix than the determinant of a million times million matrix. Actually, we don't calculate the determinant. There are better techniques. Uh, most of them go back to solving these linear equations. And once you have done, then you have the important gauge configurations and their chains to be there on, in your ensemble is proportional to their weight. Actually, you can put them on, on a laptop like that, but with a, with a large memory, but you can put them on. And these contain all the information about the QCD vacuum what you need. And the University of Adelaide made a very nice uh, video out of that. And that's what I'm showing right now. That's what you would see if your eyes had a resolution of 10 to the minus 16 meter and a 10 to the minus 25 seconds. So here it comes. That's what you would see. But this is the action density of the gluonic field on a lattice. So it's not empty. It's fluctuating. The reddish points are the denser regions, and the black one are the regions where the gluon action density is. So before I come to the mass of the proton, let me mention that usually the mass of some ordinary thing is just the sum of the mass of its constituents up to tiny corrections. But the origin of the mass of the visible universe and the mass of the origin, mass of the visible universe is mostly in protons and neutrons, UUD or UDD, quark systems, are dramatically different. The proton is made up of massless gluons and almost massless quarks. Just to give you an idea of the order of magnitudes, imagine that you have three quarks, like three cherries, each of them about five grams. And when you, once you put a massless stem on it, it's getting one kilogram. And that's something we have to deal with here. And this is the way uh, we do it. And that's the last complicated slide I want to show you. But if you just want to understand how we measure that on this background, and this slide tells you. What we measure is the so-called Euclidean correlation function of a co composite operator. You have the operator producing a proton. You act it on the vacuum and you calculate its matrix element with the, the joint of that thing. Let me put here a eigenvector, eigensystem of the Hamiltonian, a complete set of eigenvectors. Here it is. And I use the evolution of the operator. Here it is. I is an eigenvector of H. The vacuum is an eigenvector of H. I can pull it out. And what I have is a sum of exponentials. And uh, the smallest exponential is actually the energy level above the vacuum, which is just a mass. So if I can measure this thing on that quantum fluctuating background vacuum, which I showed you, 
and look at the exponential decay, then I have the mass. So far, so good. This has been done for many, many years. And since QCD is 40 years old, we had enough time to calculate in principle. Particularly since the non-perturbative lattice formulation by Wilson immediately appeared after QCD was defined. But actually we needed 20 years for the cranged result. And don't forget that means calculating the trace of three times three matrices and ignoring these terminals. And the reason why it took so long was not because people didn't have enough computer power. Actually, they had. They were always in the frontier of the computer development. Uh, there was the GF11, which was a special built computer by IBM, which they, which they defined or designed to verify quantum dynamics. GF11 means 11 gigaflops. Actually, it was 10 gigaflops, but for quenched calculations, 10% error is still OK. Then the Japanese made a, another machine with Hitachi with 16, 614 G-flops in 96, and that's the result what they got. Let me explain it in a little bit more detail. So the horizontal lines are the masses of those hadrons, of those composite particles of part. And the points here are the lattice results. And don't forget, we are looking for something which is 5 MeV as an input and 1,000 MeV as an output. And it's surprisingly good. There are 10% errors here and there, and that was believed to be a quenching effect. Unfortunately, you can't improve on quenching. You, you have or you don't have. So the only way to go on is to do something unquenched, really unquenched, including the determinants of these million tons, million matrices. And that's what we tried to do in 2008. This is the homepage of our small collaboration. A lot of young people here. Uh, our name is the Budapest Marseille Wuppertal collaboration. Some people call us BMW, they don't have anything against that, and uh, that's what we get. So here you see the mass of two hadrons. This is the nucleon, uh, proton, neutron, we put them the same because the difference between them is so tiny. Another one is the omega, which is three of these strange quarks, which I mentioned earlier, as a function of the pion mass. Pion is just quark, anti-quark, U or D. And the physical value of these quantities, this pion mass, is somewhere here. And we had a couple of lattice spacing and points, and they were just hitting this physical line somewhere here. What you don't see, which is a good thing, that there are actually three lines three different lattice spacings. And the message of this one was, this plot was, that there are essentially no or very little cutoff effects. But that has a very difficult theoretical background. You design, you tailor your action in a way to have small cutoff effects, which has the name of a semantic improvement program. So it's not enough that you have large computers. It's not enough if you have good algorithms. You have to understand the quantum field theory behind. And this brings us to this plot where I have exactly the same which I showed you. Here are the horizontal lines, the experimental values of these various hadrons. The gray areas are the widths of those hadrons because they are decaying. And the points here are the lattice results, or the QCD results, solved by lattice. And you see they are just sitting on these lines. So 
what you have in nature, you got exactly the same out of the lattice. And this was done with continuum extrapolation and extrapolation to the physical work masses. You see, you have seen that, that there was just a little extrapolation to the physical final masses. That was 2008. And we moved on and tried to include also the electric and some uh, very important feature of the Higgs interaction. And that has the name of isospin symmetry or isospin symmetry breaking. And this calculation, which I showed you a minute ago, we had degenerate U and D quarks. And that's the two plus one flavor or two plus one plus one flavor framework. And in this case, the neutron and the proton have the same mass. But this symmetry is explicitly broken in nature. The up and down quark, electric charge are different. different. The up has a two-third and the down has a minus one-third charge. The proton, as we said many times, UUD, it has a charge one. The neutron is UDD, charge zero. And at this level, the proton must be heavier because it has an electric charge. But it is not. We know that the neutron is heavier. And the reason for that, there is another effect, and these two effects are canceling or almost canceling each other. The D quark is somewhat heavier than the U quark. So what you need is a one plus one plus one plus one flavor calculation with QCD and QED in it. And that should provide us the tiny neutron proton mass difference which is 0.14%, but it is needed to explain the universe as we observe. How comes? If these mass difference were smaller, smaller than 0.05%, then an inverse beta decay or electron capture would leave only neutrons or predominantly neutrons. Even if it was bigger, but less than the value it is today, it would lead to much more helium and much less hydrogen. And that would mean that the stars would not have ignited as they did. So too small is not good for our universe. Too big is also not good. If it were larger than 0.14%, then the beta decay would be much faster. We had less neutrons after the Big Bang nucleosynthesis and the burning of hydrogen in stars and the synthesis of heavy elements would be difficult. So that means that we can ask the scientific version of that great question. Could things have been different? And Jaffe and collaborators studied this question in this nice paper. And that would mean that the whole nuclear landscape with our stable nuclei would be something different. So this is a very important number, and I'm going to calculate that number. It's a tiny number, important, but we can calculate. So I will include both electric interaction and the difference between the U and the D quark interaction with the Higgs field. It's a very long calculation. I just show you here two slides which might illustrate how this calculation works and what sort of difficulties we have. It is a QCD plus QED calculation, which means you have to include QED. But QED has a long interaction range, which lead to a difficulty in the algorithms, how we produce the fields in our calculation. And this shows what sort of problem we have. This is all the traditional algorithms which are used in the literature. And this is the value of the photon field, the Plaquette variable, which I defined already. And what you see that you are updating and updating and updating your fields, but you don't move to the equilibrium value. Even after 10,000 steps, you still remember what you were at your first step. And that's not good. 
because you want to have independent new configurations, one of them I showed you, and if they remember what it was before, then you cannot get any reasonable answer. So we had to develop a new algorithm, and here is the result of the new algorithm. It doesn't remember to the old field at all. Just one difficulty. Another difficulty that the photon field has an infinite range, that means that once you put something in a box, it will feel the size of the box anyhow. And you can try to do taking larger and larger and larger boxes, but it costs more and more and more, and you cannot finish your project. So the only way to go on is to have an analytic control over the finite size effect. You cannot solve the problem analytically on its own, but the finite size effect you can extract. And here I show you a neutral particle and a charged particle, difference to the neutral particle, volume dependence. So this is the size dependence, one over AEL, and this is the mass in lattice units. The neutral particle has no mass dependence or volume dependence, size dependence, but the charged particle has. And this is the uh, leading order, this is the next to leading order, next to next to leading order, and next to next to next to leading order, and you have an analytic control over that. And these are large effects, they are larger than the proton neutron mass difference already is. Once you combine everything, you end up with this plot. Here I have the mass differences for the nucleon, that means the proton neutron, and for other hadrons here, sigma, psi, d, psi, cc, and this is the so-called uh, and gesho mass difference. And what you see again, that the result of the lattice calculation sits just on the experimental value. Of course, you can say that the experimental value is much more precise, as we discussed during lunch, but nevertheless, reaching a point where you can have a QCD plus QED with prices spin breaking prediction on the 0.3 MeV level is a very strong proof that the theory is good. You cannot predict by that the mass difference between the proton and the neutron. But actually, you can predict some other thing. Yeah, sorry, here, these are with these shaded regions are predictions where our numbers are better than the experimental value. Actually, for Psi CC, there is no experimental value at all. So it's a risky prediction. People don't even know the sign of the mass difference. And we give it with a tiny error. This calculation brings me to the precise scientific version of the great question. Could things have been different? As it can be in string landscape or this is a sort of a quantitative anthropics question. And it's simply related with the, to the fact that the Big Bang nuclear synthesis and today's stars need about these mass difference between the neutron and the proton. And here, this plot shows you how sensitive it is to the fundamental parameters of our nature, or of our theory. So let me explain it in a bit detail. So here I show you the electromagnetic point structure constant normalized by its value in nature. So along this line, we have 1 over 137. On this axis, I show you MD minus MU divided by MD minus MU in nature. So that means that uh, if I go to zero here, that is when MD minus MZ, MZU is zero, MD is the same as MU. Or if I go to two, then in this hypothetical word, the mass difference between D and U quark would be twice as large as it is in our nature. And these contour lines show you 
the result of our calculation, the mass difference between neutron and proton. So if you have the physical fine structure constant and the physical quark mass differences, then you end up with 1.3 MeV. Now this is the 1 MeV contour line, this is the 2 MeV contour line, and this is about 1.3 MeV. If you increase the electromagnetic coupling twice as large value, then you hit these blue region where you have inverse beta decay or electric electron capture. So that would mean that everything will be collapsing. Or if you increase the D minus U to a larger value, and it goes up to 3 to 4 MeV, and then it has the problem that the beta decay is too fast, and the whole universe wouldn't exist as we know today. So this is, in some sense, lattice QCD with a very high precision showing you how sensitive it is fine-tuned. Basic parameters of nature are fine-tuned. As I said to you, uh, lattice QCD has a bad reputation, boring, technical, all that. And we wanted to move out of this reputation and we published this result in science. Actually, we, we wanted, we put some effort in it to, to uh, design a cover page. And here it is. It shows that the neutron is heavier than the proton. That was our cover page design. But they put a biology picture on the cover page. <laughs> then we were thinking about more and more. And uh, I don't know how it is in Berkeley, but in a university in Germany, as our university, we have a strong pressure from our ministry to produce something useful because what we are doing is more or less just theory, useless things. And the pressure is strong. So we were thinking to design some gadget or something like that. So first we thought about QCD TV. Yeah? We have already three colors. <laughs> That's how TV works, and there is some technical difficulty, but um, I mean, that's what research is for, yeah? But then we realized that uh, somehow the TV market is flooded with, with cheap TVs, so it won't be something uh, which market would really take. Then we moved on to half sector, you know, because we realized that, you know, millions and millions of people are stepping on a bathroom scale every morning, you know? And these scales are amazing these days, you know? uh, They can measure not only your weight, you know, they can measure the bone fraction of your body, the body mass index, the uh, muscle fraction and all that. And we made a very serious market research and we realized there is no one single scale which can measure your QCD fraction or Higgs fraction or electromagnetic fraction. And then we said, okay, we, we do that. And here is the product, yeah. Here it is, a bathroom <laughs> scale which can measure these fractions. And uh, I ask Seth, to come here, he volunteered, a student who volunteered to show us what is his QCD body fraction, what is his electromagnetic, and what is his Higgs body fraction. Sorry, it's in metric units. So we are thinking about uh, having another product with uh, pounds <laughs> uh, for the American and the Burma market. These are the two countries which are using. No, sorry, Liberia, so three countries, Myanmar, US, and Liberia. Right now we have only this uh, metric. So Seth, you can step on, or are you already on it? I, you are already on it, which means that we have a little bit of a problem. <laughs> oh, during, could you come up? During the talk, it was too, too long. It come back, perhaps now it works. Oh, great. Oh, great. 
So, what did we see here? Is that the vast majority of his body is coming from QCD. And that's what I said. Huh? So the quark masses, which are given by the Higgs mechanism, are tiny compared to the QCD fraction of his mass. Here it is. Huh? Just a tiny fraction of the Higgs part. So when people are saying that the Higgs mechanism is responsible for mass, it's true, yeah, but well, not that one. The vast majority of ordinary matter comes from QCD. And what is really, really small is this 0.033 kilogram of his electromagnetic part. But don't try to double it. Yeah. If you double it, you have seen what is happening. Taking twice as large electromagnetic coupling, you will have electron capture, and he will collapse less than a second into a tiny, tiny part. Yeah? So it's good, but it is too small. Thank you very much. And this brings me to my conclusions. And here it is. I showed you what we did in 2008, where you have the masses of the particles. What we did in 2014, we had the small splittings of those masses. And just look at the scales here. It's more than two orders of magnitude. So the precision in these six years decreased by over two, or the uh, errors decrease over two orders of vac uh, uh, magnitude. And it is all done, let me repeat it again, with a continuum extrapolation and with physical quark masses, extrapolation to the physical quark masses. And that's somehow a good news that we can reach now, super mill accuracy. And that can give us a vision about future in which high precision can be achieved for a broad spectrum on non-perturbative questions. Thank you very much for your attention. It's 55 minutes. So thank you very much for that lovely talk. We have uh, time for a few questions. And maybe somebody else wants to measure their in a, in what way? All that was done in a blind way. Yeah. Actually, this result was done in a blind way. That means, actually, I did the blind part of the calculation. You know what blind calculation means? So it was first introduced by, I think, in physics. But they usually do it in medicine a lot. You know what blind, double blind analysis in medicine is? Probably not. I have a cardiologist who told me, you know what a double blind analysis is? When a gynecologist and a surgeon are together analyzing an ECG. An electrocardiogram, that's the blind analysis. Coming back to your point, very good point. So we did it in a blind way. That means that all the results were multiplied by a random number. And then I did the analysis. And then after the numbers came out, it was 1.9 MeV, which is obviously wrong. Then you can take the random number, get it back. But as I said, these numbers here, they are not post predictions. They are predictions. So they are better than the experiment, or in this case, there is no experiment at all. What's that? The error is better than the experimental error. So we have smaller errors than the PDG provides us for the same quantity.
Yes. Well, that, that is an infrared effect, and that's an analytic control over it. No, to, to extrapolation to infinite volume, because the volume is an infrared regulator, and you want to be, want to get rid of and do it. And actually, uh, I didn't have time to speak about that for the electromagnetic coupling. There is also an infrared effect, which, which we got rid of by a renormalization procedure in a finite volume, uh, Wilson flow uh, technique, which had to be developed. It didn't, didn't exist in the literature. That's that's a very good point. That's a very good point. So I assumed an average chemical okay. potential. But you're you you're right. So people so young people have probably a bit different uh, chemical potential chemical composition than we have. The answer is is probably yes. Uh, spectrum is is the first step because it's relatively easy, though in this case it's quite complicated though, still. Uh, but we have more and more results going to that direction. So for BK, for instance, we have a full result, and uh, more and more results will come. So I think the answer is yes. Well, it depends on the question. It depends on the question. Okay, yeah. That's a long way. <laughs> yeah. Well, GA, GA is uh, a little bit controversial in the literature, but I think it's it will be it will be there soon. So it's not that complicated. Years, years. Yeah. Yeah. Well, GA. Yeah.